welcome, welcome, welcome to the April Bonded Book Club discussion. We're gonna give people a few minutes to join. So we're just gonna be chilling here. We'll be going live in just a few minutes. You can enjoy us chatting. <laughs> you can enjoy us yeah. chatting. Oh yes. <laughs> right, we've got our books. This is Bastard of Carolina, if you have your books ready. If you don't, today's discussion will still be really yeah. interesting. Yeah. You do not need to have read Bastard Out of Carolina to enjoy this discussion. We are very excited with who we have here. Paige. Hi, Paige. Hi. We're going to get into the introductions in just a minute, but you do not need to have read Bastard Out of Carolina to enjoy this discussion today. It's going to be a really good one. Also, this month is Sexual Assault Awareness Month, um, which will be pertinent to our discussion in a little while, um, um, which is why we have Paige here from Skid Vasa. So, if you just want to learn more about that, today's your day. This is the book club for you. <laughs> Good. Hopefully people are coming home from work and maybe tuning in yeah. for an educational discussion, perhaps. Relax, sit back, we got lots to talk about. Get your dinner, maybe you're cooking dinner. <laughs> I've put Tucker up so everybody should be happy. <laughs> Tucker basically attacked Paige. Yeah. When but in a sweet way, in yes. a loving, <laughs> engaging, warm way. Yeah, that's a good violent way. <laughs> he got excited. He knew what was happening. <laughs> that he wasn't Tucker... going to be a part of it. Yeah. Tucker is up, so we're good. There's like a, a, an hour of peace and quiet. <laughs> Wait, Paige, are you going to see David Sedaris tonight? This is I not know. related to our Bonded Book Club. This is just, <laughs> just fun, exciting information. This is just fun, exciting information. Yeah, so I missed him the last time around that he was in town, and I have just sort of like... Followed him, honestly, like, uh, found out about him through This American Life, so, and I've read oh, a few nice. books. So, I love running the scissors. Oh my gosh, I love So good. Um, so yeah, like, I got tickets, and so we're supposed to go this evening. Yeah, after this. We have any, do we have any literary fans here who are fans <laughs> of David Sedaris? We're not going to be talking Anyone about Anyone else going to David Sedaris? Yeah, we're really jealous. jealous. Yeah, yeah I'm very <laughs> jealous. I'm very jealous. I love David Sedaris. I've read tons of his books. Um, also, it's amazing. To me, it's amazing that somebody can write so many autobiographical books because I don't have that many stories, stories. to tell. <laughs> I don't have that many good stories to tell. They're just, it, or I no start concept. telling other people's stories and try and like, format them into like, 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 Sneak in. I've been known to do that. I did that with the Jennifer Garner event once. <laughs> Sneak in. Like, I love you. Can I be your friend? She's like, I'm supposed to be here. <laughs> it's all about delivery. It's all about how you say it. I love you and I love what you write. <laughs> Please love me. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you for joining us for a very special edition of Bonded Book Club. Um, this month we read Bastard Out of Carolina by uh, Dorothy Allison. She is a South Carolina writer um, from, from the state, which I think is particularly of interest. Um, and today we have Paige Shilton from Skid Vasa. Please tell us what Skid Vasa stands for. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's a very long acronym. So um, Skid Vasa stands for the South Carolina Coalition Against Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault. So we are the state coalition um, uh, over the state and then our membership are the ones across the state who provide direct services so like what we do is really um, promote advocacy and education so we provide trainings and resources to not only our membership but to anyone in the state who would be um, working with victims or survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault right so sort of like I said earlier this month has been sexual assault awareness month a very important month and um, Skid Vasa has created a book club where people can come and read books that pertain mm -hmm. to that topic. And so we are reading along with them, Bastard Out of Carolina. And we think this is such an important topic matter that we wanted to bring in somebody who has knowledge about this topic and can give us a little bit more insight. So Paige has been so kind to do that with us today. Thank you, Paige. <laughs> You're so thankful. So thank you, Skid Vasa. Thank you, Paige. <laughs> Bastard Out of Carolina was a fantastic book. Even just from a literary perspective, if you love good writing, you will eat this book up. It is fantastic. Such a great book. So you do not need to have read 
Ambassador of Carolina to gain something from our discussion today. So I'll give you a little bit of a synopsis of the book um, before we dive right into the questions. Bastard of Carolina takes place in Greenville, South Carolina, and it profiles the Boatwright family, which is sort of this rough around the edges family where the men are heavy drinkers and have sort of propensities towards violence towards each other, at least the other men in the community and each other. And the women have children very young, have lots of children, and in general, the families tend to be impoverished. And so that adds this very interesting dynamic to what happens throughout the story. It's important to remember that poor, part of Bastard of Carolina is autobiographical, not entirely, most of it is fiction, but portions of it are autobiographical towards um, Dorothy Allison. So the main character in the book is a young girl named Bone, and she is a very observant young girl. She probably is too old for her age, is the best way to put it. Yeah. She's seen too much, and she knows too much for her age. She was born without a father. She was born as an illegitimate child, and her mother was very concerned about the stigma that that would have for her and her community in Greenville. At some point, her mother marries um, a character named Daddy Glenn. That is his name in the book, Daddy Glenn. And Daddy get Glenn begins to both physically and sexually abuse Bone. And so Bone is faced at a very young age with a number of harrowing situations and various members of her family are forced to make loyalty decisions with other members of the family, including Bone, who is a very young child. So the book is a very intense book, but the book is a very important book and it details experiences that people have had here in the state and everywhere. And so we're going to be having a discussion about it and the themes and getting into all the details of that. So unfortunately, this book at some point was banned both from a lot of schools and a lot of libraries across the country. Why is it important that books like Bastard of Carolina be discussed, be talked about? Why do you think that we need to why our gut reaction should not be to ban books that have topic matters that are difficult to discuss or even scenes that are difficult to discuss. What do you think, Sam? So it's telling not, like we said, it's a slightly autobiographical, mm -hmm. but the author talks a lot about this is, can be so many people's story. And she wants to tell something that is difficult and challenging, but that will connect with people and say, that's me. I lived that life and help to give them a voice and also raise awareness as to that these things are happening and do it in a way that can be less nuanced than real life where you can see this is bad and this is you know good or this person is bad in a way that sometimes can get overly complicated in real life yeah. but by doing it in literature it's easier for people to understand yeah and I think that's really important. I wanted to read um, Dorothy Allison had has had talked a lot about her book being banned um, in general, but, so, but she has some good quotes on that. So she says, for that is of course what it means to read a novel and live in it for a while. You are viscerally inside someone else's reality. You feel and understand things you have not known before, and that is both scary and exhilarating. The world becomes more clear, reality more vivid, and your own experience larger. Of course there will be questions. This probing is how we grow and enlarge our sense of the world itself. Books can offer a counter narrative, another story to the one we think we know. Story is told in a voice. The voice of Bastard Out of Carolina is that of a young girl who has just lost her mother and her sense of any real hope or justice. So obviously Dorothy um, Allison feels that it's important that we talk about these stories, even if they're tough. Like they're very tough stories to read and digest, uh, but important stories to discuss nonetheless. Okay, so throughout the book, the reader is given vivid examples of the severe poverty that plagues Bone's family, both her immediate household, but also her extended Boatwright family members. What impact, if any, does poverty play in the instances of sexual and physical abuse? And this may be a good question to, for Paige to start with, because I think it's one of those really important questions that intersectionality mm -hmm. comes into play with Absolutely. that. Absolutely, let me just also check on our yeah. feed here. I want to make sure there's no problems. 
We're on Facebook Live. So says, anything could happen, guys. We're going yeah, to sorry. Live. We just want to make sure. It says we're still spreading the word. Okay. Cool. So it may take a minute. Thank you, Facebook. Says, <laughs> Facebook is like sending us messages, and I just want to make sure we're not oh, no. missing anything okay. here. So what does poverty play in the role of Bone's life and the difficulties mm -hmm. that she faces? Both, either one of you yeah. can start. Well, I was, um, when I read it, uh, I, well, I actually, in um, uh, all fairness, I did the audiobook, which was beautiful and lovely, but um, uh, I, what, what I see is, um, is that, like, I think a lot of people, I, I love that this isn't based in South Carolina, first of all, I love that it, um, it talks about rural Southern folks and their experiences, um, but I think the intersections that we're talking about is how, like, well, first of all, um, domestic violence and sexual assault can happen to anyone. But I also think that a lot of um, the barriers that are set up for Bone are kind of like there from her existence. And so um, she doesn't necessarily have all the chances or opportunities that other folks will have. And I think that plays into the fact even her mother making a choice of marrying a man who she felt was the right decision, but she also needed that support and that financial support, um, emotional, physical, those sorts of support systems that might not have been the best for her children, but were the best for her. And I think right. I think that folks who grow up like poor and in rural environments and don't have many opportunities provided um, or available to them have to make those tough decisions. And so it's not anyone's fault for making those tough decisions because it's like oftentimes they're make, doing the best that they can do. Uh, and I think it's important to like acknowledge that while we read this and never give anyone like fault or blame but also like just like right. have it sitting there while you're processing the information you know something that i was like i they brought up multiple times in the book was like food scarcity and shelter scarcity mm -hmm. how do you think that that sort of like played into um mama annie's decision to continue to stay with the abusive daddy glenn mm -hmm. so i think it can be I think twofold. On one hand, it can be a distraction when, for the mom even being able to recognize the extent of the abuse that's going on, when her goal is, I just need to keep a roof put over our heads, I need to put food on the table, we have to eat, it's a it's a survival mode. Yeah. And so when it's like, we might starve to death or have nowhere to live, and she can start to try and rationalize some of the abuse, that can become an right. issue. Um, and I, I think also just, you you don't have any spare resources and that can put not you, even brain resources right you don't have like, any resources like mentally or financially to spare and it doesn't excuse any of the abuse but it does complicate the situation and make it even more complicated right. for for Annie the mother so there was a scene in the book where um, bone and her sister have no food on the table and mama Annie has to feed them saltine crackers and ketchup like that's sort of the amount of poverty that we're talking about and the decision making that she is faced with feeding her kids putting food on the table staying with an abusive husband and how challenging that can be and how that decision is not just i'm gonna leave and this is super easy so everyone in the book refers to bones stepfather as daddy glenn he himself makes a huge issue of insisting that bone and her sister call him daddy always validating it with how much he loves them. Um, this is all despite his actions that are in direct conflict with what real love looks like and how a father should respect his daughter. What impact do you think this had on Bone and the confusion she felt and the shame that she experienced surrounding the abuse? Like, what? why do you think, first of all, like he had him them call him Daddy Glenn even though he was abusing Bone? Because that's a really complicated question yeah yeah I'm go ahead no oh so I think it has a lot to do with outside perceptions mm -hmm. um, not only oh, what he's yeah. doing to like confuse bone with what she's experiencing but how everyone else is gonna see him and make it harder for them to believe that he could possibly be hurting them you know it's this constant right. I'm your daddy I'm daddy Glenn I love them right. he tells the mother all the time I love them you know I love them um, and so it can confuse not only the girls as to what it means to have a father or to feel love, but also right. everyone around them, that he couldn't possibly be doing the things he was doing, right? right. How much he projects the opposite. Mm -hmm. 
so badly and I think that's expressed later when they do try and have a child and he is like extreme intent to like want that to come yes. to fruition so he wants these children to be his children because they're important to Annie um I, I think it becomes uncomfortable to say daddy Glenn or to have that connotation when we realize what he's doing to bone but like you know is if Reese right like her, his, right. her sister doesn't have the same experiences so like she gets an experience of this father who is like loving and taking care of her and all these yes. things. It becomes an issue when they continue to force Bone to like use that terminology and to like call him her father when at the beginning of the book they won't even talk about her her, her actual father. Wow. You know? Oh, that's a really and good so they're yeah. it's like they're trying to force her to just like take take ownership of this man as her, as her father no matter what happens because they feel like that is so important to them right. that she not be a bastard, right? right. And so yes. uh, it's kind of like forcing that into her life in that way. How do you think this um, changes or sort of forms her perception of what love is and him requiring her to call him daddy and him also requiring her to understand that I love you even though I abuse you? Uh, well, I, I, th I think to me it becomes very difficult because what she, what she's learning is like what love means by not only seeing her mother and his relationship, but, but like by acknowledging her relationship with him, which is supposed to be a father daughter one, which she's never had before. So she doesn't have a, like anything to go a off basis. of yeah. Yeah, a, a foundation for that. Um, and so it's teaching her that this is what love is. She knows that it it's wrong and it hurts and it feels bad, but she has nothing else to base it on. Um, and I think later we might get into this, but when she finds faith, there are some like connotations there that come to play of like trying to, like how you relate the father and like the spiritual like father to like her daddy yeah. and, and those sort of things, like I think tie in in a really like heavy way. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. totally, Absolutely. totally. Yeah. So Bone's identity as a female shifts tremendously throughout the book. She worships her uncles and takes pride in being a tomboy, yet she says, I liked being one of the women with my aunts, liked being a part of something nasty and strong and separate from the big, rough boy cousins and the whole world of spitting, growling, and overbearing males. What role do you think that gender plays in this book? To me, the way I saw it, it had a lot to do with control and power. Mm -hmm. And I think she sees this power that a lot of the men hold, but also feels a safety when she's with women. Mm -hmm. And so wanting to like harness the power that she sees that men can kind of wield, whether it's through like physical violence, but also knowing that when she's surrounded by her mom and her aunts, that is actually the place that she feels the safest. Right. Um, and so I think that that kind of creates a dichotomy of like what does she want, you know? But she also sees the women be abused and be used and not right. have the same power that the men do. And I think that kind of like influences where she wants to fall in that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, re like, what relationship with other characters in the book helps to shape her understanding of gender? Like she sort of has like the relationship with her mother and Aunt Raylene, like her mother is this very feminine person. Her Aunt right. Raylene is this very independent woman. Like how does that shape her and does that, do, do you think that that constricts her, constricts her understanding of gender or does it free her? Um, does that make sense? Yeah, I think it gives, well I, in a sense I'm grateful for it though, that she gets to like kind of figure this out on her own because there's so much that she doesn't have control of. But so yeah, you see her be a tomboy and really identify with the men and like love being a part of that crowd. Right. But like as much as like you were talking about power, yeah, and I like and again like abuse and these sorts of things are about power and control. But I think she finds a sense of power and belonging and almost magic sitting around the women. And she's learned at a young age that if she is just quiet, she can learn all the secrets, right? And so yeah, yeah, I love like, that. It's like the women hold the secrets and she knows everything by just like being there and existing in their space because they're creating the space for her. Um, again, which I think is like the loveliness about like female relationships and how like that uh, takes hold. But I, I like that she can see her mother be this like 
um, sort of uh, feminine, almost frail sometimes um, person who has to rely on um, her stepfather for everything and sides with him and doesn't side with her and those sorts of things but then can see her aunt in another light who like has never taken a husband who doesn't have children and these were decisions that she made uh, and she has a very happy healthy life and then also now has space and a life that like she can take in um, other family members right. when they're like in bad places right. right so like yeah it gives her that sort of control over her own life that the other women in the family don't get to have. Yeah. And she's sort of like, at one point she talks, well, there's lots of points, she talks about her frustration of being a little girl. Like, do you remember the part where she's going to go <laughs> and rob the convenience store that she kind of got thrown out of earlier? And she wants to carry, like, the sack with all of the stuff to break into it. And she's like, I wish that I was a boy because then I could carry all that stuff and I wouldn't need my cousin to do it for me. Because I'm a girl, people will suspect that something is up just because I'm a girl. Okay. Like, I wish that I could, like, hide in that, in being a boy so that I could do what that I want. That boys, they, because they excuse the uncles all the time. They, yeah. Just being guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They can get away with stuff that she feels she cannot get away, get away with. with. Like, the yeah, uncles right. get to be drunken and violent and have, nobody thinks anything of it. They're just, like, boys being boys. This is how boys are. But there's this sort of, like, heightened public awareness of the women, which is probably why also mom, her mother, is so concerned about public perception about not only their family, but about Bone being a bastard child and wanting to fix that on her birth certificate. There's just like all of these interesting little mm -hmm. gender roles that understandings even that weave their way throughout the story. Mm -hmm. So there are several instances in the book when you think Bone may tell someone about her abuse, but she never does. Paige, maybe you can talk to us a little bit about why you think someone who is experiencing sexual or physical abuse, especially a child, would be hesitant or unwilling to come forward about that. Mm -hmm. Like, what are there's a lot of complexities there. Yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah. I can speak to like the story specific that I think Bone again. We're kind of talking about a 12 year old uh, at this point, but the way that her voice comes out and her personality and her ownership is a much older, um, like, aged person. I think she takes responsibility over the family. She knows that she has to protect her mom, she has to be brave and strong. Uh, she knows that her mother is in love with this person and that he does provide for them in certain ways and that she she actually acknowledges that he's a good father to her sister and she doesn't want to take that from her. And so I think that uh, she kind of puts all of this on her as if it's her fault. And I think a lot of kids do that. Yeah. Like, I must have done something wrong. And I think a lot of times during like the abusive situations, like the yeah. physical abuse, she acknowledges that like, um, well, I know I was sad, like I was being sassy or I said this or I did that. And so she's yeah. trying to like rationalize in her mind why this might have happened. And then like that becomes her reality. Mm -hmm. And so then to like go run and tell about that uh, doesn't seem so realistic because it's her fault. So she doesn't want to get in trouble. So mm -hmm. I think there's a, she doesn't want to get herself in trouble. And I think a lot of children experience that same feeling like they must have done something wrong and they don't want to get in trouble if they tell an adult. But they like this is technically an all you know perf like for her reality her father so she doesn't want to get him in any trouble she knows how her family is and how they might view it and they like kind of have that a tiff with him and yeah. I think she's just constantly trying to be the grown up and be protective of him by also protecting herself right yeah and I wonder if part of it too is like so while she's being at least physically abused her mother is aware of it and doesn't do anything to protect her. And so the person that you think that you could trust the most, your mom, doesn't do anything. So like, how does that shape how you view other adults? So like she, at multiple points during the book, she, there are opportunities where she goes, where she's beaten, like literally her bones are broken. She goes to the hospital and the doctors ask what happened. And she says, mm, nothing, doesn't wanna talk about it. Her aunt at one point asks her, and then at the very end of the book, a police officer asks her. And so by the time the end of the book comes around, she literally is relating the police officer to her stepfather. And she said, he is just another daddy, Glenn. This is how I view him. I'm not saying anything. Like there's a strong amount of distrust. And part of me wonders if it's just like the person that I trusted the most, my mother, yeah. 
didn't do anything, why would I tell anybody else? Mm -hmm. So that's sort of something that I was thinking about too. Do we think that, and, and I may just be extrapolating, but do you think that there is any relation to, she definitely comes from an oppressed community, living in a very poor rural area. You don't ever see like authority, like police or anyone step in in any way. True. So like an ingrained mistrust of the system to do any good or help anyway. Right, sort of right, this right. take law into your hands, into our hands, right? right? So they, when they first find out it's the uncles that beat him. They don't call the police or sort of this idea that coming forward at the end to the police yeah. officers doesn't, do, it's not how they handle well, things or doesn't, do it. it's not how we do it. And yeah. sort of this idea that that doesn't help me anyway. They're not uh -huh. there to yeah. help us. And it's a, a way that they operate. Yeah. As a I like family. to speak to that a little bit, but that, yeah. cause that is the case. Um, oftentimes I would say in general with domestic uh, or with intimate partner violence and sexual assault, that is often the case. But I think also being in a like southern state that we are, the whole phrase of like what happens in the house stays in the house mm -hmm. um, is just like predominant. And you don't want to air your you know grievances or the things that are actually going on in the house. So you don't want the public. You don't want your you know um, congregations to know your neighbors to know you're trying to like hide this thing and so folks have gotten so used to taking care of it internally yeah. and whether it's actually taken care of which is probably obviously not the case right or if they're right, taking right. care of it in the way that they think is the right way like it's not being done but that's the culture that's being uh perpetuated and, and and permeated is that like we handle it on our own don't speak to anyone and i think she's just picked up on those things yeah is that like i you know like I, I won't say anything it'll go away or someone will within my like comfort unit my like community my interpersonal we'll take community will take care of it right? yeah and there's it's definitely this dichotomy throughout the book of like public perception and private perception Absolutely. so throughout the book um her mother Annie is afraid of people finding out various things and Bone is afraid of people perceiving her as quote trash mm -hmm. and so they take these steps to try and mitigate that throughout the book and they're fearful of that mm -hmm. and so I, I understand why they would also keep these secrets that may make them appear to be what they're afraid of being perceived as as quiet mm -hmm. and how that can really like complicate issues and coming forward and actually getting help yeah. Yeah. and whether or not there was help back in 1960 something we're going to talk about that not sure but this was also this book took place in what the 1960s so not even sure if there were types of organizations that could have helped them back then so um, okay so from um, from when the author what the author shares with us it seems that the abuse by daddy Glenn is only happening to bone and not her sister Reese and not to Mama Annie. Why do you think that Daddy Glenn specifically beats and abuses Bone and not her sister or mother? I would love your take on this page. Okay. If you don't mind. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I was thinking about this because it's, um, I guess, from what I would see normally or how we would normally talk, like, uh, the the root cause of abuse is going to be like power and control and oftentimes that person in the household wants power and control over like everyone um right. so it is odd in this specific case like that it's stressed with bone i think the only like and this is an opinion that like it's because of the age that she was at a um but also b perhaps because she stood up for herself she was um uh, you know a little sassier she didn't question him I think that he always felt a disconnect with her and that she wasn't just willing to like cave in and immediately right. accept him as her father that she was a boat right through and through and yeah. that she wasn't going to like be part of his family or adapt to his ways and so they always butt heads Whereas like her sister was younger and um, didn't really remember her father, I don't think. I think maybe he passed before she could quite remember yeah. that. And so it was easier for her to just adapt to his ways and what her mother told her. But like for Bone, she wasn't gonna have that. And I think that speaks to the power and control. So maybe the other two folks in the house were allowing him to get his way and she was not. And that's where that like, uh, those like intersections happened and he was not having it so he had to 
maintain control of her by any means, and that could be um, by sexually abusing her or by like physically abusing her. So, yeah. And there like is definitely two characters that are contrasted between her and her sister that I'm remembering from the book. Yeah. So like Bone, they tell Bone all the time, you're ugly, you are a boat right, you are the embodiment of all of these things that we hate about ourselves. <laughs> And her sister Reese, they're like, you're beautiful, you're womanly, you're feminine, you're everything that we think a young woman should be. And so they made sure to let her know that. And by the way, it's probably worth noting that Bone was under the age of 12, like the age, like what, six to 12, throughout the whole book. Yeah. So when I had said earlier that she grew up very quickly, like very quickly. she was tackling issues that I don't know most adults have tackled yeah. at the age of six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So I sort I sort of wonder if that's part of it too is like they always were telling her she was never good enough. She was never who they wanted her to be or who they hoped she would be even though the family didn't necessarily mimic what they wished they could be either. You know what I mean? Like there was, it was interesting. I, yeah, I think there's actually a part where it might be the first instance that he actually physically abuses her like uh in a like violent way, uh not sexually but physically. And or it might come in later, but he tells her the reason I'm doing this is because you're not acting like a lady. You yeah. Know? Like I'm yeah. trying to basically beat you into submission yeah. to act like what I think a lady should be because she was like running through the house and being a child. Right. right. She was, she was a acting child. like a child and he wanted to beat that out of her so that she would be quiet and complacent and listen yeah. and like obey. Right. Yeah. So yeah. So that definitely could have been, not that that's validating, but maybe a part of it. Mm -hmm. Um, so in the middle of the book, Bone becomes quite religious. She claims, quote, I became fascinated with the idea of being saved, not just welcoming Jesus into my heart, but the seriousness of the struggle between salvation and damnation, between good and evil, life and death. What do you think, first of all, inspires the newfound fanaticism and interest that she has in specifically Christianity? So I think she talks a lot about this fascination with like good and evil and also a sense of like belonging and all of a sudden she doesn't have to worry about daddy Glenn being her father she is a child of God and there is very clear right and wrong and she can I think too there's a sense of shedding shame by accepting this and I yeah. think it becomes this place where she can see a way to fit in and explain things that she's not understanding right now she can find some sort of um sanity to what's going on in our life through religion and I think it becomes an obsession because she's so lost at home right um there's not clear-cut rules at home no is like this is like it seems like order and consistency and like a safe place to like oh I can find a place and also here. like so when daddy Glenn was sending her all these mixed messages of like I love you but I beat you mm -hmm. she had as a child especially issues are very black and white. You want to look at issues as very black and white and not all these like gray areas. And religion to her, it seemed like, felt like this more black and white area that she could easily process. Whereas at home, she's getting all these mixed, I love you, but I beat you. Mm -hmm. That's very unclear. And why would a child understand that? So she goes to church, she goes to listen to the gospel, and she's like, this I can understand. I can process this. There's good, there's evil, done. And she talks about the attention too. Yeah. Like this idea, like, she loved the idea of like almost getting saved and having the yeah, look about yeah, her yeah, yeah, and like that. this attention and they're gonna save her and she's like all eyes are on her and this moment where she matters yeah. and so she doesn't matter. I want to like explain that a little bit. So she yeah. talked about going to churches and when you would go to the front and they would call people up to the front and maybe you've experienced this, I've been to churches where this happens lots this of times for me. <laughs> <laughs> where you get called up to the front and you get saved in front of everybody mm -hmm. and people come and lay hands on you and they love you seemingly and give you attention. She That also seemed to sort of like be on par with like the gospel singers that she was like almost worshipped who were like celebrities to her, all these people who were getting all this amazing attention and seeing her like really just like honestly just seeing her mm -hmm. and seeing her for who she is and it didn't really seem like she wasn't being seen at all when she was at home but at church she felt like she was being seen don't you think oh, yeah. 
Yeah, I was. Uh, it's funny, and this is my 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 feelings from reading it. Yeah. But I I totally got a you know she says I went to a different church every Sunday. Oh yes, uh, yes. yes she and did. I love I, I love this about her because she wasn't like I I actually saw it as that like music that she loved led her like the gospel music led her to the gospel if you will. Right. Yeah. But I never really actually thought about it as her being religious because I don't think she really care. I don't think so either. She didn't care about the gospel. Like, she was there to try and, like, it was an escape. But also, yeah, like, talking about what you were talking about was super impactful for me where she was like, I wanted to get to that edge and that precipice of feeling like I was about to be saved and then not because that was the elation that she needed. And I think that kind of, like, ties into some of the stuff that, like, as she's, like, developing sexually. Like, that, right. like, I think it yeah. actually, like, ties a ties lot. Ties oh, Because absolutely. I think there's a point, and correct me if I'm wrong, but, like, a point where she actually, like, lets the finale happen. She's like, right. okay, I'll, like, ex like, be saved and, like, be, you know, baptized or what have you. But she, she was, does. like, more, like, horrifically disappointed and felt, like, empty again. Yeah. And I was, like, I'm so sad for her. I was, like, I'm so sad that you don't have this thing to look forward to every time that, like, makes you feel safe and wonderful and alive because the thing that actually, like, in Christianity is supposed to make you feel alive made her feel dead again. And so, yeah. like, I thought it was really intense just, like, how she viewed it and how she kept, like, traveling from church to church so she could find that safety. Yeah. And, yeah. How do her religious feelings, do you think, relate to her relationship with Daddy Glenn? I don't, uh, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to go. Do you want to move no, on? no, I, I do <laughs> think. Hard for me. Yeah, yeah I, I do really think hard. it has. Um, I think it plays a role in this looking for a father, yeah. and that, you know, when you're at church, you're talking a lot about being a child of God and having a father, and then she's at home and it's Daddy Glenn, and there's this very confusing relationship, and I think that that complicates it, and I think that's why it didn't quite feel right at church either. Right. Like there was still something that was missing. How do you think her going to church and finding religion related her to her feelings of illegitimacy? So sort of in the beginning of the book, they talked about how she was a bastard and how there would be this tremendous stigma for her and her mother spends a lot of time trying to amend her birth certificate to not show that she didn't have a father. Like a tremendous amount of time fighting people yeah. with the court system and trying to fix it. And ultimately at the end of the book, she does. Mm -hmm. So she spends almost Glenn's, or not Glenn, um, Bone's entire young lifetime trying to fix this issue. How do you think going to church maybe related to that issue where she felt stigmatized for being without a father? Yeah, I was like, uh, I think it ties into the same, right? So I th I think that what you talk about being like not a believer when folks are calling you into that, the church is calling you into that, is you are illegitimate in a sense, right? Yeah. Like you're not God, God's child until then you like accept him. And I think like even just saying that right now feels weird because like it was, she almost felt like I have to accept like Daddy Glenn. Uh, right. If if I'm going to be like legitimate and own and feel special and be a part of this, and as she tried, I mean, she literally did try. She wasn't a terrible child or anything. No, no. she did she all. Was a normal child. She did yeah. all the things that like yeah. a child would do, and like really wanted him to be her father. So yeah. like I think seeing that be uh, the case, I think there's that like push and pull, which is why she didn't want to quite like move over into the other side, if you will. I think. Right. And I think it's important to like just acknowledge overarching outside of the book that like a lot of times we use these analogies so like haphazardly about like God being the father, but we never take into effect about like how survivors have these like traumatic backgrounds yeah, and how it yes. can actually like trigger things when we're saying like obey your father, like trust in him yeah. entirely, oh, listen yeah. to everything that he says, um, he's going to love and protect and support you and all these things and all these things and I think it's important for like faith communities to like maybe acknowledge that and like yeah. talk like maybe not switch the language you're not gonna like change scripture or anything but I just like have that conversation openly about yeah. how like there are members of congregations who like might be traumatized by, by like that type of understanding yeah, so, yeah absolutely that's a really that's a really good point so the book utilizes symbolism um, throughout including the love knot the hook 
um, and perhaps the most powerful, the birth certificate. What do you think is the significance of the birth certificate throughout the book? And Annie eventually giving it back to her after a harrowing scene at the end of the book. What do you think that that even means? Like trying to fix the birth certificate and then eventually giving it back to her daughter and leaving her entirely. So I think the, this whole issue, they, they battle with being seen as outsiders, as trash, as they talk about it. Yeah. And this is kind of that linchpin for Annie and Mama. Um, I think even more so than for Bone, I think the birth certificate really means something to her mother right. as like, if I can just fix this, she has a chance at like being normal, being like everyone else and not being seen as an outcast, right? There's this constant push and pull of where outsiders, where outcasts were looked down upon. So if she could just fix that one thing, it would remove the stigma. So at the end, when her mother does what felt like the most like heart-wrenching thing, she's like, but here I gave you this life without a stigma, right? Like right. it feels like her mom thinks she's giving her a gift. Yeah. while also leaving her without a mother now. So yeah. it's like, here, I said you're no longer fatherless, but now you're, you're motherless. motherless. Yeah. I, and it was just like, yeah. hard. <laughs> I was wondering, and maybe you guys remember the beginning a little bit better than I do, but like, I remember them never wanting to, or never allowing the grandmother to talk about her father. You know, they would sit yeah. around and drink yes. tea and chat and like gossip, mm -hmm. which is like in a good way, like in a beautiful like relationship way. Um, but they just like her mother never wanted uh, them to address that. And and to me, now that I'm like reflecting on it, I just wonder if like could it have been that 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 relationship was also like abusive or negative and so she didn't want it to be addressed uh -huh. like why would you want your child to know about their father when they're like this type of person right right and so maybe she was thought she was protecting her and then had to like not that i want to give her a, too much credit you know right. like no, she did exactly. a lot of like yeah. terrible things but Perhaps. At the same time, we have to like look at people's like like we we're talking about like they, we all have layers of trauma and like different like parts of our identity. So we don't know what she's gone through and like no. and she had her at fifteen. So what did a fifteen year old no, right yeah. you know like okay. deal with uh, you know getting pregnant for, for the first time and like have to be by herself on totally. her own and like who was that man and what was his personality? Right, like, absolutely, like, yeah. absolutely. What do you think is the significance of the love knot? So the aunts when. Mama Annie gets married to Daddy Glenn. They give her this love knot that she buries in the potted plant soil. What is like? What is the foreshadowing of that? Do you think? What do you think that means? I think it was really just sort of this. She had to hide the love knot from Daddy Glenn because he didn't believe in the superstition that the ants and it was supposed to be like, oh, don't tell him about I'll it. Like, but I'll like put it over here and it'll be fine. Um, and we'll do it this way instead of putting it under the mattress. It was very much this foreshadowing of a way of saying like this isn't he's not really a part of our family. This isn't yeah. really gonna work. And the out. love knot, I think if I'm remembering correctly, was supposed to bring peace and harmony to the household. Yeah. And it was and they literally treat it the way it, it was supposed literally to be yeah. forged out of like her sisters, like their hair and their blood and their nails. Yeah. And it was supposed to like literally be like, You're now a part of the family. This will bring you serenity and peace and joy and love. And that was the opposite of what happened. Yeah. So it was sort of this like eerie foreshadowing of like what never came to be. And maybe it was because she had to hide it and he didn't approve of the love knot and like the connection yeah. she had with her sisters yeah. in that way. Um, okay, so what do you think, at some point, um, Bone finds this hook. She's at her aunt's house, she's digging through the marsh, finding stuff, and she finds this really sharp, big hook and she becomes obsessed with it wants to keep it near her. What do you think is the like the meaning of the hook and why she is so intrigued with it? Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, well, I, I actually hadn't processed that. Like I was processing while reading it, but I haven't really got to yeah, the yeah. answer. Like uh, for me, it felt like a discovery. It felt like maybe something that was safe, but then her ties to it in this almost like sexual manner uh -huh. also like came up to me and how confusing and strange that that like that felt like for a 12 year old to be like identifying with this like Shark object objects. of violence yeah right like this object of violence in a sexual way um but i didn't get really further than that and now like uh analyzing it and like i was sort of like i remember her thinking that every time 
Daddy Glenn was in the house, she wished that she had the hook with her. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So like, not even thinking that like she would use it, but she felt safe with safe. it being yeah. there. Yeah. And maybe that even goes back to like the whole like her wishing that she could be strong and like bigger and stronger to protect herself at certain points during the book, and at certain points wishing, oh, I wish I had the hook with me. Mm -hmm. Like I felt like it was this like thing of not only she had these like sexual feelings about the hook but or as it related to the hook rather, mm -hmm. but like this wishing that she had it with it to almost protect herself with. Like it had all these like different layers to yeah, it. Yeah, it was like mm -hmm. both power, but also danger. Yeah. Right? Yeah. She saw how yeah. scary and sharp it was. And I think that sort of fueled, you know, she talked about having these sexual fantasies of like related to the abuse where it was this dangerous situation where she was strong through it. And so like that relating to the same idea that here's this, powerful hook but it's also dangerous yeah. um is this very confusing feeling for right. her where she's like drawn to it because it's powerful but also afraid of it because it's dangerous mm -hmm. and yeah like carrying it with her like she wanted to have it with her all the, all time. the time which and was like thinking her. about it when it wasn't in her in presence, presence she and... like wears the hook and when it was in the house with her she felt better yeah. but when yeah. it wasn't in the house with her she was always thinking about wish i had that hook with me wish i had that hook with me so author Dorothy Allison writes in the um, afterword of the most recent version of the book that the voice of the Bastra of Carolina is that of a young girl who has just lost her mother and her sense of any real hope or justice. You don't know who she is until the story ends, and I always intended for the ending to make the reader angry. Anger is definitely how we felt after finishing the book. Maybe Paige, you can provide us a little more insight or understanding if such a thing exists as to Bone's mother. Uh, Mama Annie Boatwright and the decision she makes throughout the book, especially the ending, that continually prioritizes Daddy Glenn above and in spite of Bone. Yeah, I think, um, so I was going to read like one of the quotes that like Aunt Raylene um, mentions when she's taking Bone uh, back from the hospital. Her mother isn't there. It's sort of like insinuated, obviously, that her mother is dealing with her personal matters with her husband and not there for Bone when she leaves the hospital, but she says, uh, no woman can stand to choose between her baby and her lover, between her child and her husband. And I remember kind of feeling shocked by that, but then again, uh, as we were talking about, there are these layers to people, like we're not one thing, we're not like one identity, we're like many faceted people. And I think with like Annie, the mother, uh, and we talked about it, like or had thought about like how it's not just financial with her it's you know which is the case a lot of times with the abuse right. there can be a financial tie like you can't actually leave because there's nowhere to go and there's no way to support yourself but I think with hers it was so emotional um, she had like uh, an emotional tie to him and then like refused to see what was actually happening so that she could continue to like move forward with like her own personal happiness and again, I don't, I don't know if I have the answer to like what that yeah. is or what that looks like, but uh, perhaps it could be, and this is like, you know, an opinion, if you have a life of pain and strife and no opportunities, if you can experience that love, even if it's still in the midst of this like pain and poverty and these things, but you have someone to like go through those trenches with, then you're gonna hold on to it, even if they might be the person like creating this chaos, right? Right. So I, I, I think that she just didn't know how to let go of him. And I, and I don't know what that tie was, because again, that the story is from the perspective of Bone, who maybe again also didn't like, under, obviously didn't understand while well. her mother right. left her. Because she was 12. Yeah, she was, she was 12. Yeah. yeah. Did you have any thoughts on that, Sam? Or I feel like that's probably a great way to end our discussion. This has yeah. been like an amazing book to read. We would highly recommend Bastard of Carolina. Um, if, as just sort of like one thing to like end the discussion on, um, if, would you, Paige, if this, if this book took place in 2017, do you think it would be more or less hopeful? For bone, yeah. For bone, yeah. Um, Sorry, for bone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, there are some instances where she does um, come in contact with folks outside of her family. Uh, so, like, if I would say, like, if it was in the family, you would, no one would, like, know about it. But she goes to the doctor. The, the first doctor is, like, furious about what's happening, right? And he knows exactly what's happening, but because no report is done, 
nothing gets done, same thing, thing right. sort of happens the second time around because she refuses to speak, they don't do anything. Um, that doesn't really happen now, like when a, someone who is a child, if a doctor, if they go to you know a hospital or a doctor or something like that and they like absolutely know that it's abuse or even suspected, they, uh, they can report that. So I don't know that doctors are specifically mandated reporters, but like schools are, you know, like teachers have to like report those sorts of things. And so I think in maybe the first case, who knows, you know, if right. she just had like a broken arm, they could have like written that off. But when she comes into the hospital, like extremely abused, not only physically, but sexually, um, at that point, the law sort of takes over the parents, um, like desires or wishes or even the child's, you know, um, it was surprising to me that because in the setting and the time in this rural area that like uh, the parents had so much control and this uh, this other right. system like went to play whereas now I think other things exist. A better. Yeah, there's so there's and there's also more services. So like when we look at like how she ended up in the end on her own or with a family member, we have services now where folks can like get counseling and their families can get counseling and it's free and so I just don't know that that existed then or if it did maybe not in those rural areas right so um, that's at least some, some Sounds like hopeful. slightly more hopeful yeah. um, so if somebody wanted to learn more if they knew somebody who they suspected was being abused or if they wanted to learn more about that mm -hmm. Could you tell us a little bit more about where yeah. they can find resources on that? Yeah, so um, SCADVASA, the South Carolina Coalition Against Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault, we are the state coalition. So we're the umbrella that provides training and resources to the service providers in the state. So you can always call us. Um, our number is online. We have our website, Facebook, you know, those sorts of things. You can give us a call and we can direct you to the right person who's in your area. And we, you know, we'll, we'll do everything in our power and control to help you, even if it's with um, counseling, um, we, like hospital visitations or like accompaniment if you need to go, or if there's legal services where you're just like not sure how to like navigate this through the legal system. Um, the, all those services are provided through our memberships. And we'll make sure to put your contact yeah. information yeah. into this we'll, video. We'll put the contact information into yeah. the um, caption portion of this video. Yeah. We would love to know what you guys thought about this book if you read along with us. If you want to comment in the comment section, um, if you want to reach out to Paige, we'll put her contact information on there. She is incredibly knowledgeable about all of these matters and has been so wonderful for you, to, for you to come and take time to talk to us about this. This was not necessarily easy to read or talk about, but it is an amazing book. Truly, from a literary perspective, it is a beautifully written book. You will fly through it. It is so great. Um, I think there's even a movie on it. I have not yeah, seen I a movie. Seen it. I, so I can't vouch either. I can't vouch for the movie, <laughs> anyway. but there is a movie. So anyways, we'd love to hear what you guys think. Comment in the comment section, and we'll see you for next month's book club. Yeah, and thank you, Paige. Yeah. <laughs>